welcome everybody. This this webinar is going to be recorded and will be shared uh, after the webinar in, in digital platforms uh, from HDF Group and, and from Hermes websites. So first of all, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Anthony Kugis from Illinois Institute of Technology. Um, and I'm happy to be here to present to you some of the latest developments in our system, Hermes, uh, which is a distributed buffering system. So we have prepared a really nice agenda for you today. Uh, we're gonna have a little bit of a project overview. I'll go over very quickly from an architecture like a recap, and then we're gonna um, present the latest developments uh, in Hermes, which is the buffer organizer. We do have some uh, results and some you know, presentation like demos and things like that. We will uh, close with future work and some time for questions and answers. So let me start by introducing the project itself. Uh, Hermes is a collaborative project funded by NSF um, between the Illinois Institute of Technology, the HGF group and the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. We're very happy and thankful to the NSF uh, for funding this project. So I'll start with the, uh, what is it? What's the problem statement? What's the area we're working on? Traditionally, memory systems uh, and storage demonstrate wildly different performance in terms of latency or bandwidth uh, and data representation. Uh, applications experience performance degradation due to slow uh, remote access to storage. So there's an IO performance gap between a typical parallel file system, uh, usually based on disks and in memory subsystems. So a lot of modern storage system designs include multiple tiers of storage organized in a deep distributed storage hierarchy. Um, the goal is to mask uh, the IO gap between memory and, and disks. Each system, however, is independently designed, deployed, and managed, making it very difficult to reap the benefits of the hierarchy. As you can see in the slide, like there's a bunch of different uh, uh, technologies and software associated with the hardware deployments. Uh, different file systems uh, optimized for different mediums and and it's a, it's a little uh, the landscape is quite complicated for the end user to be able to deploy and mount and and utilize all these extra storage tiers so ideally the presence of multiple tiers of storage should be transparent to applications without having to sacrifice io performance so here, uh, this is the, the area that we, we, we aim to uh, help uh, with this uh, new distributed uh, multi-tier buffering system called Hermes. Hermes wants to abstract all of those tiers and just provide you a, a simple uh, buffering tier, buffering layer where all the tiers and all the movements within the tiers are handled by the library. So in highlight, uh, it enables and manages and supervises I operations uh, in the deep distributed storage hierarchy. Hermes is not a storage system, it's a buffering system. So it doesn't really change anything to your uh, typical application. Uh, it's transparent. Um, you just link to Hermes, you buffer in Hermes, and then you can instruct Hermes to say, I want the, you know, my data to be flushed out or written permanently in your uh, backends. It offers a selective and dynamic layer data placement uh, it's modular, extensible, and, and we are mostly performance oriented. And we want to support a wide variety of applications, uh, including scientific computations and, and big data. Uh, in terms of the ecosystem, it's a collection of different, um, uh, you could say like uh, plugins or, or, or modules. The first and foremost important is the Hermes core library. Uh, that, that's the main thing that uh, manages tiers transparently and facilitates data movement in the hierarchy. We have developed and we are welcoming uh, the community to develop even more uh, adapters. Uh, and I'll say a little more things about the adapter layer, but so far we have a POSIX, a standard IO, an MPI IO, and a PubSub uh, adapter where uh, the applications doesn't have to like change anything. You just link to Hermes. There's an POSIX adapter. We capture the IO and we send that to the native API down to Hermes. We do have a Hermes virtual file driver for the HDF5 library, which makes it a very um, easy for, for the end user to use. You just have your library, you set your VFT to Hermes, and then all your IO is going to be buffered into Hermes uh, without any, uh, any difficulty. We also uh, 
working on a vol uh, and the vol for it's a virtual object layer. So we want to capture high level um, representations or, or you know, access patterns and statistics from the HDF5 API and then communicate those things down to the Hermes library for further optimizations. If we know what you're gonna do, let's say reading, and we can we can kick in the prefetching within Hermes to accelerate read operations. And finally, there are some ad additional tools uh, outside of the Hermes library. You know, so the architecture very high level and very quick to recap uh, for people who are new here or we they never seen this project before. This is the core library has a bunch of components. Uh, today, actually, do I have a mouse? I do have a mouse. Uh, I don't know if you see the mouse, but we're, we're going to be releasing this soon, <laughs> like today or the next week, uh, the buffer organizer here. But uh, there's a lot of uh, interesting things here. The API is very simple. We follow an object store uh, kind of API with boot puts and gets. Um, there's a data placement engine that's responsible to uh, place incoming data into the hierarchy and, and fully like distributed and, and, and tiered. Uh, and then there's the internal components like the buffer pool manager that does the allocation of buffers across the hierarchy, manages the buffer IDs and all of these things, metadata management and things like that. We do have a collection of IO clients uh, that they can be hooked into, you know, RAM tiers, NVMe tiers, PMEM tiers, best buffers, and also all, all kinds of different uh, layers outside of Hermes. So uh, the adapter layer, as I said, we, we want to make easy uh, for users to to plug in Hermes into the workload, the workflows. Uh, that's why the adapter layer, I think, uh, it's pretty critical to uh, the adoption. Uh, but the most power, I mean, as is as it's the truth for any software out there, it's the native API. You can do a lot of things. Um, but you know, again, the adapters are there to help. Um, okay, a little bit uh, about the data model, uh, just for you to understand what is, you know, the terminologies and the model we have. So maybe in the buffer organizer, you won't be a lot of, you know, lost. So everything in Hermes um, starts with like a blob. A blob is a unit of data. And it's a key value. It, it presents itself as a key value pair. The values, you know, they are interpreted by the array and it's stored internally as a collection of buffers across multiple tiers. So a blob in a way has a composition. It can have a collection of buffers, maybe a couple of buffers in memory, a couple of buffers in NVMe, all of them together, they're presented to the user as a blob. The user just pushes the blob or reads the blob, get, puts and gets the blob. A collection of blobs can be placed in a bucket. Uh, it's just you know, a flat blob organization. You have a bunch of blobs, you wanna uh, you know, organize them in a, in a collection, uh, that's your bucket. Additional to that, we have the concept of a virtual bucket where uh, you can link blobs across multiple buckets. And it just, you know, again, it's another con construct for us that allows us to do additional capabilities. Like in a V bucket, you can link a bunch of blobs across different buckets and you can attach a capability we call trait. That trait can be simple as, I wanna put all of those blobs into this virtual bucket and apply compression. Or I wanna put all of these things into this virtual bucket and instruct Hermes never to evict these blobs from memory. Okay, that's like a, a special capability, right? And then you can do that across multiple uh, buckets. Traits can be a lot of things, like an ordering trait. I want you to keep them in order or a grouping or a filtering and all kinds of different things. We do have already implemented a, a, a collection of them, but you know, again, this can be also user driven. Uh, if you have a particular operation, you can uh, code that and, and put it as a trait uh, into your uh, code. Okay, a few things about the project. Again, how can you get involved? We would love the community to be involved. We're looking for people, uh, applications people, developers, anybody who's interested in this space. Uh, the, you know, the GitHub repo is on the slide. Uh, please, you know, feel free to use it. You feel free to create, uh, you know, an issue for a feature request, for a bug or for whatever it is. Um, it's still under heavy development um, and you're welcome to join us on the forum uh, for you know any conversations or any other things. Okay, cool. So that's the, the project. That's the main architecture of the project. Let's talk a little bit about the buffer organizer. Why is it important? Why do we have it? And what's the main objectives? 
So, you know, a little bit of a simple observation, which to many of you may be very clear and very straightforward. Uh, the way you write things is obviously not always the same as you read things. And, and especially in an environment where you have multiple tiers of storage and multiple nodes and content being written in permits, being distributed everywhere, and also vertically and horizontally, like everywhere in this space, it means every blob will be injected in, this, in the space, but it won't be uh, always there in that location. So how you read it might be affecting where the blob is moving inside the hierarchy. Um, so we do have this model, a predictor corrector model, where we have the data placement engine making near optimal, I'll say, as much uh, as possible optimal decisions to place content into the, into the hierarchy. And then we have the buffer organizer kicking in asynchronously in the background, trying to reorganize buffers and, and move around blobs to the appropriate locations. That can be a simple scenario. For instance, you have a checkpoint application, everything is writing. You want to make sure upper tiers of the hierarchy have enough capacity to accept incoming IO as quickly as possible. So what we do here is like a, we, the buffer organizer will, will start checking their upper tiers of the hierarchy and start moving blobs previously written to the bottom parts of the hierarchy. Again, the bottom parts of the hierarchy might be devices that have that are more dense, they have more capacity, but they may have less bandwidth and higher latency to access. But again, it depends. So this buffer organizer in, in summary has a couple of responsibilities. First, it's the management of the hierarchy of the buffering space. In this, in this um, content the context, we're really referring to how do we flash things you know, from, from upper tiers to bottom tiers? Do we pipeline content down? Do we you know, forward things across tiers and things like that? So that's his responsibility, it, its responsibility. Another thing is read acceleration. Again, maybe some of your blobs are resting in a bottom part of the hierarchy and then you wanna kick in an analytics job or a consuming job of this content where buffer organizer will aim, will try to elevate those blobs from the bottom parts of the hierarchy to the upper parts of the hierarchy. How does it do that? Uh, Chris can tell us more in a minute, but in, in principle, uh, we have a scoring scheme that tries to score blobs inside Hermes based on how hot these things are. Hotness is a function. It can have a lot of uh, variables there, like the frequency of access, the recency of access, um, sequentiality of blobs, but like, uh, do they belong together, locality, different things like that. But we try, we aim to capture that hotness and naturally allow the buffer organizer to place, to move content that's hot into the upper tiers without you know, the user having to be involved in that. Second one, you know, the buffer organizer will manage the data life cycle of, 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 the, of, of the, the content, of the blobs. So as I said earlier, when is the blob in equilibrium? Like once you write it, should we leave it there and forget about it? Or does the blob, you know, move uh, in the hierarchy, both like vertically up and down the tiers and horizontally based on who is requesting access to that? Like, so that's again, um, with an objective, of course, to eliminate unnecessary movements, right? Because this equilibrium means the buffer organizer won't always move things around, right? So we have to have a lot of control over these things uh, inside the implementation. So that's the buffer organizer objectives. I will let, uh, I will give the floor to Chris Hogan, our, our lead engineer on the project. And um, with that, Chris, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Anthony. Uh, should, should, should you present maybe your screen or should you want me to be moving the slides forward? Uh, I'll present. Okay, let me stop here and then Chris will present. Uh, stop sharing. All right, perfect. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, I'm Chris Hogan. I'm a software engineer with the HDF group, and uh, I'm going to show you uh, some 
how the buffer organizer works, why we need it, what it can do, um, and some results. So to get started, I like to choose just simple examples to make it really easy to understand. So our motivation here is uh, just an example of an app that's doing checkpointing. So a very write heavy phase. So think of it like heavy compute phase and then heavy write phase. Uh, and also I'm imagining we are using an adapter. So we're intercepting IO from an existing application that's doing this checkpointing. Um, and what will happen is we'll intercept, Hermes will intercept those writes and start writing, redirecting that data to the hierarchy. Um, and in a write heavy case, you would use a data placement policy that uh, goes to the most capable tiers first. So it will start writing to RAM to get the fastest bandwidth and then spill over to NVMe and finally burst buffer. This is the hierarchy we're working with. Um, so after a while, uh, after some writing, your first two tiers will fill up. So this is the status we have now. Hermes, RAM, and NVMe tiers are full, and your burst buffer tier is completely empty. So at this point, all the future writes will just go to the burst buffer, and you'll essentially get the worst performance. It's the worst case scenario in Hermes for this, uh, for this application. Um, on the other hand, if you're in this state, this is great for reading because all your reads will be from the fastest tiers. Uh, but for writing, that we're, what we're talking about here, this is the worst, uh, the worst state you can be in. But I will say, even though this is the worst state for Hermes, it's still better than not having Hermes at all because in that case, you would be going to the PFS, whereas here, at least we're getting burst buffer speeds, which should beat the PFS. Um, <clears throat> So what can we do about this? What's the solution to this problem? Well, ideally, um, we would be, as these incoming writes fill up our RAM and NVMe tiers, ideally we would have a background process, which is the Borg, uh, migrating data out of those tiers and pushing it down to the lower tiers, thereby freeing up space in fast tiers so that incoming writes uh, get faster bandwidth. Uh, and that's exactly what the Borg does. Uh, make space in higher tiers by moving data to slower tiers in this uh, write heavy case. So the next question is, how do we decide which data to evict or kick down to lower tiers? Uh, and that's where the scoring uh, comes in that Anthony mentioned. We have a concept of importance scores for each blob. Uh, and we track those based on recency, frequency, and some other uh, elements. And so the least important data gets evic evicted first from the most capable tiers. Um, and now, assuming you have enough, uh, enough compute, you can kind of, this is all, all this IO is asynchronous. So Assuming you have some compute that can overlap, the board can be a background moving, moving things down, making space while your application is writing to these fast tiers and everyone's happy. Um, and here are some results of an application that does exactly that. Uh, the blue line is without the buffer organizer. And what I've set up here is a hierarchy where I'm doing 2000 puts and the first 1,000 puts basically can fit in the RAM and NVMe tiers. And the second half, second 1,000 puts uh, have to go to burst buffer. And we see the first 1,000 puts getting RAM speeds. And as soon as those two top tiers are full, we drop down and we get burst buffer speeds the rest of the way. Um, interestingly, in this case, NVMe speeds are RAM speeds because of the page cache. Uh, essentially, assuming you have enough memory for caching, uh, all your writes just get cached. So that's basically RAM speed. So that's why it's that's why NVMe looks as high as RAM. But if you have memory pressure, NVMe will drop down a little bit because it'll have to flush immediately. Um, so the red line is when we introduce the Borg. Um, first, you'll notice that the top 
the high bandwidth of the Borg is a little bit less than the highest possible bandwidth without the Borg. Uh, that little gap just represents the overhead of adding extra thread, threads to do this movement, calculating which uh, blobs to evict, and keeping track of scores and all that. So there is a little overhead, but you see that in this case it's worth it, 1.7x speed up. Um, and the the Borg, the capabilities of the Borg manifest its way manifest itself a couple ways in this graph. First, you'll see that. Um, the blue line trails off around after 900 puts, but with the Borg, it's able to get a few hundred more puts in there because while it's operating here, it's making space in RAM, so we get a little bit more uh, extended top speed. Then we finally do fill up completely and we drop down to burst buffer speeds. But as we're doing the, this IO to the burst buffer, um, the buffer organizer is in the background, constantly uh, moving things down, just like this. And so once space gets cleared up, we get these bumps where it's like back back to closer to RAM speeds, uh, like heartbeats here, spikes and bandwidth. So we spike back up here when, and then we fill up the RAM and NVMe, and then we spike back down to burst buffer. Uh, buffer organizer makes some more room and we spike back up and down. So uh, to show this behavior, I'm looking at the average bandwidth for every 30 puts. So I wanted this, I expected to see these spikes and that's exactly what we see. Um, but if we, rather than looking at uh, this average bandwidth, let's look, we can look at total throughput. And also this is just one rank. Um, so I looked at total through, throughput and I scaled up on a single node to uh, saturate all the cores on this node, 40 in this case. Uh, there, there's one buffer organizer per node. So in general, it, I mean, you can do, other nodes can call buffer organizers on other nodes, but in general, a buffer organizer needs to support as many ranks as a single node can support. And so in this case, you can see we get 4x speed up. And once we get up here, the buffer organizer is using eight threads in this example. So the machine is a little bit oversubscribed. But in general, we get a 4x speed up uh, when we are using all the ranks on a, on a single node with the buffer organizer. So pretty cool. Um, now let's look at the opposite example. Rather than a write heavy example, let's look at a read heavy example. Um, for this, let's pretend we've been running an application for a while and somehow we end up in a state like this where RAM is empty, NVMe is empty, but our burst buffer is full. Uh, this could happen in several ways. Maybe you'd open several files and then you close some files that you didn't need. So those files happen to be up here. However you get here, let's pretend you get here because this is the worst case scenario for reads. Um, this is the best case scenario for writes because you get maximum write bandwidth, but for reads, uh, worst case scenario. And again, I'll say, even though it's the worst case scenario, it still beats going straight to the PFS because you're reading from burst buffer. Um, so what can uh, the buffer organizer do in this situation? Well, it's essentially the same thing, just the opposite in the opposite way. Uh, take data from the the slowest tiers and move it up to the higher tiers. Um, and again, which data we, do we choose? Uh, we we choose based on that important score. So the most important data should belong up in the higher tiers. Um, this this doesn't. It's a little different from the write case because with writes, all we care about is free space. But with reads, we care about having the data we're about to read up here. And that's where prefetching comes in, um, which will be a future webinar. That's what we'll be working on next. So right now, the Borg isn't perfect in this case because even though you have your important blobs up here, there's nothing to say that an application might want to read You know, something that's still considered unimportant by Hermes, but that the application chooses to read. 
uh, we'll, we'll start to solve that problem with prefetching. But in this case, most of your data will uh, be moved up, so the majority of your reads will be faster. Um, and here are the results for this style of application. Without the Borg, we get basically just burst buffer bandwidth. And these are small writes, so it's, that's why it's not so great. Uh, also, I think this is a, this is a single rank doing uh, 32 kilobyte writes. Uh, so pretty slow just with the burst buffer, but we turn the Borg on and uh, the Borg is in the background constantly moving uh, data up to fill these higher tiers. And so the reads are uh, getting RAM and NVMe bandwidths. And again, here, the more compute that you can overlap, all the time you're computing, you're giving the Borg more time to do this data transfer. So essentially, the more compute you have, the closer this number here will approach RAM bandwidth, assuming you can fit however much you can fit in there. In this case, again, it's uh, uh, half my data can fit in NVMe and RAM and the other half in burst buffer. So if I take everything from burst buffer and put it in NVMe and RAM, it can all fit in this example. Um, so this should be twice as fast. I'm still working on closing some performance gaps, but right now it's a 32x speed up, which is really cool. Um, all with no code changes to your application. Um, okay, so that's read heavy, that's write heavy. Those are the obvious cases, uh, the easy cases. What about everything else, <laughs> every other application in between? Uh, mixed workloads and how how can a user, what kind of control does a user have over, over this component? Uh, well, we provide a an option in the configuration file called BO capacity thresholds. And this gives you a set of values for each tier. So for example, here, I have a set of values for a pair of values, a pair of values for the RAM tier, a pair of values for NVMe, and a pair of values for the burst buffer tier. And then for each pair, we have a minimum and maximum capacity threshold. What does that mean? Uh, basically, the minimum capacity threshold, you're telling uh, the buffer organizer, hey, keep this tier full at least, in this case, 80%. So here on this one, I have 80.8 uh, .8 as the minimum threshold. That's saying I want RAM to be 80, at least 80% full all the time because I have a read-heavy workload and I don't want thing, I don't want my RAM empty while my burst buffer is full. So keep RAM 80% full at all times. That's the minimum capacity threshold. The maximum capacity threshold is the opposite. Uh, so for a write heavy case, you would want a high maximum or uh, a maximum threshold less than one, which would be 100%. So this is saying, um, if my RAM goes above 70% capacity, then start moving things out. It's saying keep space, keep available space open in RAM because I know I have a lot of writes incoming. So that's the min and max thresholds. So uh, if you to completely disable the buffer organizer, you set the minimum at zero and the maximum at one because you'll never move anything below 0% capacity and you can't fill anything beyond 100% maximum capacity. Um, and then anywhere in between is where you can attempt to tune the buffer organizer's behavior to your application. Um, so these are the examples that I used for the two demos that I showed. Uh, for a write heavy, um, we don't care about minimum capacity because we want to max out those, those uh, or I'm sorry, we, we care about maximum capacity for the high tiers because we want to keep, this is saying keeping 30% available. When RAM fills beyond 70%, flush things out. So you always, essentially, are always trying to save 30% space in RAM for incoming I.O. Same with NVMe. Um, and then for read heavy, we're saying, I want my RAM to always be at least 80% full. So 
RAM should never go below 80% capacity because I'm, I know I'm going to be reading a lot. Um, so once, once RAM goes below 80% capacity, that's when the buffer organizer starts kicking things up to try to fill it past that 80%. Um, and you can also configure uh, the number of threads that the buffer organizer uses. So if you know that you have a workload that will require a lot of data movement, you can give it more threads. And if you know that you don't need that much data movement, you can cut it down a little bit. Um, the other, so this is the, this is a user facing behavior. There is some system side behavior uh, where every so often Hermes checks in with other nodes and looks at the state of the hierarchy to see what the current capacity is. And it has to update the kind of a global metadata thing so that everyone, uh, every epoch, you know, everyone has to kind of sync on what the capacity is. And at that point, um, the system can look at internal uh, buffer uh, blob scores and look at the importance of those scores and compare that to like the current uh, access time of like how, how fast would it be to read? So if you have a blob that's like importance 100, but it's in burst buffer, its access time is really low. So internally in the system, we're always trying to bring those two uh, things together. That all happens in the background. So the only thing the user can do to control that is you can actually set the the interval at which that is checked. Um, so just just to just to show that we're doing things in the background, but you can also do uh, have some control over things. Um, okay, so that's the the buffer organizer, and I'll talk a little bit about what our next steps are in the roadmap in the coming few months. Uh, so the Borg is basically done. I'm closing just a couple small performance gaps right now. And once, once that's finished, I will merge it and release version 0 .0, uh, 0.8.0 beta of Hermes. Uh, so as soon as you see this 080 released uh, on the Hermes repo, which is here, then the board will be in there. Uh, Hermes is currently beta software. We are working on a monthly release schedule and we tend to alternate bug fix releases with feature releases. Um, this, this release will be the buffer organizer and then we have a few activities com to complete before we uh, release our first major version 1.0. Uh, stage in, stage out workloads. Uh, these are uh, jobs that can happen uh, before your main application, before or after your main application runs. So stage all your data in from parallel file system into Hermes, start your application, read from fast buffering, uh, end your application, and then Hermes moves everything in, that kind of thing. Uh, Prefetching, which I already mentioned, that will be uh, in the next uh, feature release. And then we're working on real applications on real machines. Um, so. We'll, that's what we're looking at for the next few months, and we're hoping for uh, version 1.0 around October. Um, GitHub repo is here, and all the documentation is in the Hermes wiki, uh, and the best place to start is this getting started guide, which walks you through an example of using the uh, adapters with IOR. Um, that's it. I think we can take questions now before we go into the FAQ. Thank you, Chris, that was amazing. Uh, yeah, before we continue or we wrap up, um, do we have any questions? Let's monitor the chat or if you have any live questions. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, so what I'm, what I'm getting from this is that you can link Hermes into an existing application and it will intercept the calls and just do this tiered buffering for you. Is that correct? Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
what do you need to do in terms of setting up your infrastructure to make use of this? Uh, good question. Uh, you, uh, if I understand, you're asking more about the deployment kind of models we have. Yeah. There are a couple of them. So one is the, you just connect the application with Hermes and Hermes is tightly coupled to the lifetime of the application. So the application starts, think of like an MPI in it. We intercept that, we launch Hermes, we launch some sort of processes in the background for every node, the Hermes core, we call it, that may have, you know, a few threads or whatever, but that's the initialization phase. The program continues, executes, you know, does all the IO, all the buffering at MPI finalize. We wrap up, we do whatever we need to do to clean up the Hermes deployment, uh, you know, evicting content out and, and killing processes and things like that. And then we exit with the application. The second mode is what we call usually a Hermes daemon mode, where you can just launch Hermes on your allocation. Say you're the, the scientist you know, came, it got like a hundred compute nodes and a couple of IO nodes for, I don't know, buffering or whatever, you know, deployments like best buffers or, or shared IO nodes with fast uh, flash storage or something like that. Then you get the allocation, the user is responsible to get the allocation from the global job scheduler or something knows the nodes, launches Hermes on those alloca allocated nodes before the program starts. Hermes is there up and running, waiting for the program. The program arrives, again, during initialization, connects to Hermes demons, does a lot of IO, the program exits, Hermes is still there. Content is still there, data is still there until you kill it manually, right? Uh, if you have a workflow, for instance, that's a great scenario because you can have producer consumer stages of your workflow and then you have Hermes demons running the entirety of the workflow and therefore you don't really need to manage you know movements between instances of Hermes or things like that so you launch demons your producer programs write buffer data into Hermes the consumer programs read out of Hermes after the whole workflow executes you just uh, kill the instance like I mean of course the content it's on user. If the user wants us to evict and flash permanently content out of Hermes, we can do that. If the user doesn't care because he, he used Hermes as a temporary scratch face, the content will be deleted. So that's all like clear semantics provided by the library and the user. So these are like a couple of ways you can deploy Hermes. Uh, I hope I answered your question. Okay. We have a question from the chat. If I knew how much write IO say in size I have per node, how to figure out the percentage of Borg, the mean and max, so I can get near RAM performance for all IO? Uh, fantastic question. Why don't you start playing with it? You know, run your jobs and let us know how, how, how what was the percentage? <laughs> Again, uh, it's very workload specific. Uh, since we are actually doing now more testing and more application driven deployments and scalability tests and even the buffer organizer, we'll have a little more intuition, more like rule of thumb, how to properly configure th these things. Um, I, you know, I know it's a lot really an answer, but it is what it is. Like, you know, we go, we learn as we go, right? Like every, every major software is like that. So please use Hermes, let us know your experience. You know, where did we, we, we mess things up? We can fix it. Uh, another question from the chat, are data able to be reconciled with permanent storage systems like PFS? Yes, a um, couple of ways, right? So if you're saying everything should be transparent, I don't even know that the Hermes exists in between my application and my parallel file system. So let's start by default. By default, you have your application, say it's an HDF5 application, it produces HDF5 files, and the uh, output of all of that ends up in the parallel file system in the form of HDF5 files or whatever, POSIX files or whatever you have, right? If you connect Hermes into this, uh, as you, you know, may be understood from the presentation, we will intercept all of this IO, we buffer all of these things into Hermes, at that stage, there is no HDF5 files because everything is buffered in Hermes and Hermes has a different data model with buckets and blobs and everything. At the end, 
let's say you close a file or you close uh, you know, your data set or you finalize your job or whatever it is through the configuration of Hermes, you're instructing Hermes to say, go and reconstruct the original HD5 file I wanted to write in the pilot file system. And therefore all these buffers and all these uh, blobs are gonna be go back to the HDF5 file uh, on the pilot file system. I hope I answered the question. Fantastic. Any other question? We'll be welcoming any, any kind of question. I do have some pre-prepared questions. <laughs> uh, again, it's kind of things that we uh, we heard from community and from uh, friends and you know friends of Hermes in a way. Uh, one question we have is like the integration in the HPC environment. A little bit of the deployment models earlier. The question, uh, I think I kind of answered that. But ideally, um, what we would like to see in a way, or or the vision is that. Uh, system administrators should also be a little bit involved in that. Uh, you know, users not always, they're not always an IO expert and they don't always know everything to, you know, get the resources and allocate everything. So in, in combination with a scheduling layer that kind of um, allocates buffering resources and a co-buffering resources very loosely, that could be the RAM, uh, some percentage of RAM, uh, allowed by the user to be used as buffering space, you can set it to zero. Like no one forces you to use RAM, but if you have a data intensive job, if you provide some RAM available, say 20% of every node is available to Hermes for buffering operations. You know, these are the things that we would like to kind of solidify moving forward, like uh, getting the NVMEs on the compute nodes. I mean, we, we can manage that. Like the Hermes library will mount it and will use the NVMe drives and all the buffers are gonna be allocated into the drives or SSDs or whatever you have. But a little bit of a coordination or, or co-scheduling with the global job scheduler is a fruitful area of research for this space where management of resources and Hermes as the software that manages all of that is coordinated with the scheduling layers. Um, other questions, some sort of dependencies. We try to keep dependencies for the software very minimal, but we do have some. We're using Thallium, uh, a RPC library for high performance computing. We do use Glog, the Google logging library. Um, MPI, you know, it's supported for, you know, MPH and open MPI. Uh, release uh, implementations. The CATS2 testing framework is also used if you want it. Um, and you can learn more, of course, on the GitHub repository as on README. It's also in the official SPAC repo now. So yes, if your SPAC great. is new enough, SPAC install Hermes should work. Great, that's a very good comment, Chris. You're right, like we did work with SPAC and now it's officially in the SPAC modules. And if you have availability on that, very easy, SPAC install Hermes and everything else should be working fine. We did play a little bit with Docker images for like quick and easy deployments for testing and playing with Hermes and see what, what's it about. So we do have that as well. Uh, but you know, I don't know how many uh, HPC sites have like, you know, Docker and things like that, but again, uh, how to start with Hermes. Again, do I need to make changes to my applications? No, there's the adapter layer, no code changes, LD preload and should work. Um, uh, just reminder, POSIX, standard IO, MPI IO. We did work on a publish subscribe because a lot of, you know, maybe streaming applications that just want to publish content into Hermes and that, that, that library is capturing that, pops up to models and intercepts that and pushes it down to uh, the native API. Uh, and I think the HDF5 workloads should be very happy. Uh, we work, you know, we're partners with HDF group and Hermes, you know, from the scratch wanted to be uh, playing, you know, well with the HDF5 library. So the HDF5 VFT layers and the walls and all of these things should, should be uh, helpful for the community. Um, other things, I don't know, we have any questions in the meantime? Hey, Anthony, this is Rob. How are you doing? Hi, Rob. This is good. How are you? Good. So uh, one of your one of your slides showed that you have kind of a POSIX 
uh, way to get at things, an MPI way to get at things, a VFD way to get at things, and a VAW way to get at things. Could you just sort of reflect on all those different kind of modalities and, and the advantages and the disadvantages of those in the context of accessing the HDF? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. So um, as you are very well uh, aware, the HDF library, uh, it has all of those like layers, right? Like you can do on the API and then within the library and then it reaches the VFD and eventually it's, we can do POSIX, right? So first, the POSIX adapters and standard IO adapters are trying to just capture any kind of POSIX workloads and, and, and standard IO workloads by analyzing Argon actually data traces from you know the, the repository you guys have a lot of jobs are still like POSIX and standard IO a lot of these things so that's the fundamental thing again linking to that disadvantages well there you might be careful a little bit of what you're intercepting there is a way to exclude certain directories or certain paths so the interceptor doesn't do that and buffer like other things except your your uh, application IO uh, again, a little bit of experience there with the preloading and, and for instance, you may be preloading a bunch of libraries and, and then you have to make sure that, you know, there is an order to that of how, you know, which call, again, there are maybe some solutions, I think Liv uh, Livermore or Berkeley worked on a library that resolves preload dependencies and things like that. So again, suggestions to the community. Um, but but on the positive side, everything is transparent. Like uh, you can just run it, and and your code is not changed, and it works. And we're happy with the performance we see. Uh, on the on the HDF5 side of things, uh, you can still use the POSIX adapter and leave everything unchanged because the HDF5 library eventually will call POSIX. But we thought it would be even cooler if and for technical reasons cooler, uh, if we develop the virtual file driver. At that level, really, you don't have a lot of high level uh, mappings of, cons of, of, of data uh, structures, like data sets and chunks and groups. Things are starting getting lost in the VFT, but you do have some sort of an, in, um, a tag or something. This is metadata and this is raw data. So for that, I think it's really interesting to us that we develop the VFT to take advantage of this kind of categorization of what kind of data am I writing right now? And we develop different mapping algorithms for metadata that usually are very small and in different order like kilobytes or bytes and things like that to map them to RAM buffer IDs. So we can kind of keep them more in RAM or, or in buffer collections that they are more organized for smaller IO. And then we have the raw data that just maybe split, kind of like the split VFT that can go to like a different allocation or different tiers or, or, or can handle them differently. By managing the splitting of metadata and data at the VFT layer, we actually achieve better performance than just blindly buffer anything out, out of the POSIX driver. Uh, so that was a motivation. And, and further to that, you could do custom mappings like say the program is doing chunking or, or you know, hyper slab selections and things like that, you could be able to develop your own mapping algorithm at the VFT layer that as data arrive, you can map them in the hierarchy differently. Right now, what we use, we use a paging mapping, which is looks at the file and says, here's your page, let's say one megabyte page size. So every one megabyte becomes a blob in the hierarchy. Anything that lands within these offsets, it will land to the certain blob and it will be mapped to the blob. But you know, I think I think there's an opportunity to do custom mappings and you know per workload mappings that can even further accelerate things. Uh, in terms of downsides, I don't see a lot of downsides for the VFT. It's just an environment variable. You said it, you know, in the beginning. It just links to that and should work fine. And it does reconstruct the file at the end. So you do have the same output uh, at the parallel file system level. Um, I don't know if I answered the API IO, again, similar logic, right? Just different interfaces. Uh, it might be a little more tricky. Like I, th I think to be honest to the community, the driver we have, the adapter we have, you know, it's tested and, and you know, with well-behaved workloads and not a lot of complicated MPI things. and. But you know, uh, it's a more complicated interface, and and, and so we, we hope we can develop it even more. It does support all the operations, all the APIs support it. 
uh, but you know, in terms of tested and scalability, we haven't tested like 10,000 cores, uh, to be honest with you. So we want to do that in the upcoming period, trying to test it more and more and work with partners to try to scale the solution uh, to bigger scales. I hope I answered the question. Do you have any other uh, question on this matter? Well, I think so. Um, I think you also showed a vol implementation. Is that? The vol implementation is actually ongoing right now. Um, okay. It, I want you to think of the vol we are trying to, to do not as a bypass of the HDF5 library and go right to Kermis, because there are vol vols that redirect the entire mm -hmm. thing to something else, uh, which is cool. For us, I think what, what's important is to kind of maybe capture that higher level understanding of, of the operations. If I right. knew a few things there, if I, if I managed to capture some statistics, you know, your data set open could be a trigger for Hermes, like a synchronization point that says, hey guys, we're opening this file. We're probably gonna read it, do something about it, kick the prefetchers on, you know, on and stuff like that. So we wanted to, leverage the vol as a hinting mechanism, as a driver of behavior from the program. Okay. Uh, and and, and kind of like communicate some of these hints and synchronization points to the library down. So so in that case, then you would you would still probably probably use the VFD implementation, yeah. but what but with a little extra information. Yes. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. Cool. That's the that's the idea. Uh, and we're okay. developing it right now, actually. So it's like pretty cool. Yeah. We have right. more to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Sure. Um, I think we're we're running out of time. MPI is a Hermes. Okay. Uh, I, I tried to answer. Yeah, yeah. I was just like, what is this? Uh, do we have any other questions? Uh, I'll be happy to take them. Uh, let me see my notes. Do we have any other interesting things for you guys on the questions? How much RAM should I set aside for Hermes buffering space? Again, I answered that thing earlier, configured by the user. Should be 10 or 20% available for Hermes, our recommendation, but it depends on the program as well. Uh, what's the footprint of metadata? A few megabytes. Uh, is there any interference between Hermes and OS PageCast? Yes, <laughs> it's a long story. But yes, there is interference. Uh, we we want to make a little more st studies on if you disable the OS page guys and you only have Hermes or should they work together and you know things like that. But yes, uh, prefetching. Uh, I I know Chris mentioned the prefetching is coming, uh, and the staging in, staging out. I will I will end the webinar with this um, kind of future steps we're taking, and I think are very important. Um, not I think, I think we think as a group and as a team um, and what we hear from the community. So staging in, staging out. And I kind of want to hear also your thoughts from the community about this. Um, obviously nothing is free. Moving data from an, outsour an outside source into your allocation, in this case, Hermes, is expensive. If you try to move a few petabytes of data, it will take some time, right? Because you're reading from parallel file system. So first question is, who is paying for that cost? Is this part of the job? Is this part of the system administrator, like just moving things in and out? Unfortunately, we don't have the power uh, as our independent Hermes library and authors of this library to influence a lot. But I've been talking to the community and, and I think what's common across sites is that there, there have been investments in this kind of better storage mediums, PMEMs and NVMEs, but they're underutilized. And I think the main reason was the lack of software to do that. So we believe that there's an opportunity there that Hermes can come in and um, manage those hardware, this fancy hardware. And as uh, adding the staging in and staging out capability, I think it will allow the users to kind of have a, a free mind in terms of using all of this complexity. Effectively, what we're envisioning is you go into your scheduler, you say, hey, here's my Hermes staging job. Uh, that will spawn Hermes, the daemon version, uh, into your allocation. It will launch the reading program, the staging in program that you know you allocate, you, you tell the program what you want to stage in. Very descriptive, 
it can be files, it can be part, you know, uh, HD5 things or you know, a whole directory from a folder or something. And then we read all of that into, into the hierarchy. Of course, we read it and we place it using Hermes library with the data placement engine, everything is hierarchically you know, distributed everywhere. And then your program can start. Your program ends, uh, you can do programmatically a stage out and inside your program if you want to change your program or you know on, on finalize or you can exit the program and then launch the staging out job that will go and uh, evict everything from the Hermes demons out to your uh, preferred output um, so staging in staging out pretty interesting things we will be working now on this on this functionality and finally the prefetching as as, as uh, Chris mentioned which uh, it's not the same with staging in staging out like prefetching uh, refers to content already inside Hermes and we want to you know kind of we know a read is coming what can I do to influence the speed of that read one thing we can do is manipulate the blob composition where is the blob right now it's spread across the hierarchy 50 percent of the blob is stored in best buffers we go in the prefetching phase and we say well can I manipulate that and have 80 percent of the blob into RAM because I know a read is coming. So this is a little bit of orchestration between the Borg and how Borg is moving those blobs up and down and the prefetcher. So the prefetcher will be this trigger, this engine that kind of manipulates the blob composition. Uh, and with that, if we don't have any other question, I will end the webinar here. Thank you all for attending. Uh, again, content will be available online. Please check out our, our GitHub. Please, you know, use any of this community uh, infrastructure we have set up and feel free to contact us uh, at any time. If you have a use case or a, a program or a problem with data movement, data sharing, you know, IO being slow, we, we're here to help. Thank you all for attending. Enjoy the rest of your day and the weekend.